Not over the hill. Who's that service with the county She's 23. And the not be fruit, the uh, parable of the uh, pot. And now we're going to something uh, uh, pretty personal to Ezekiel. Uh, we got through 14 last week. And let's begin with what's up on the board, 15. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Quote, Son of man, behold, I am about to take from you the desire of your eyes with a blow, and the Holman Bible has a fatal blow, but you shall not mourn, and you shall not weep, and your tears shall not come. You groan silently, but make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put on your shoes. Put your shoes on your feet, I'm sorry. And do not cover your mustache, nor eat the bread of men. Now, if you were Ezekiel and had been a prophet of God now for about four years, what would you think this is referring to? The faith that awaits Jerusalem. I'm going to take away from you everything that's precious. That would be the city, the temple. And of course, I've told you that they thought that that would never fall because of God's presence in the temple and in his holy city, Jerusalem. And of course, you've got the preceding context where Jerusalem is likened to a pot that's going to be scorched and burned and all the inhabitants poured out. So that would be the natural uh, understanding that the prophet would have that he's speaking here of his and his fellow exiles, precious city of Jerusalem. And uh, these commands obviously would make sense when after the rather degrading picture that he has painted of Jerusalem as the two sisters and so on and so forth. So when she falls, no point in mourning. Don't mourn of her because she deserves everything that she is getting. She deserves no mercy and she deserves no mourning either. So he was to conduct himself in a normal manner and not act like one that was in mourning. In other words, just another day. And he was restricted from accepting any favors. That's the word of mourning. And that's, and we still do that today. We take meals to those who have lost loved ones. Because to do that would be an out demonstration of mourning. And he says, and you can groan silently. That is, he says, I don't necessarily forbid you from mourning. But sorrow, but uh, there are to be no public expressions of the sorrow that was coming, and Ezekiel thinks it's to I knew this would happen. Here's what it speaks of. So I spoke to the people this morning. And the evening, my wife died. And in the morning, I did as I was commanded. The people said to me, "Will you not tell us what these things mean that you are uh, these things you are doing mean for us?" Then he said to them, "The word of the Lord came to me, saying, to speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, I am about to take, about to profane my sanctuary, which is the pride of your power." and the desire of your eyes and the delight of your soul and your sons and your daughters whom you have left behind will fall by the sword. You will do as I have done, Ezekiel tells them. You will not cover your mustache and you will not eat the bread of men, that is, except a funeral meal. Sir? John's Bible has casserole there. Okay. Okay. That's a pretty liberal translation there. Uh, your 
garment will be on your head, verse 23, and your shoes on your feet. You will not mourn and you will not weep, but you will rot away in your iniquities and you will groan to one another. Thus Ezekiel will be assigned to you according to all that he has done. You will do, and when it comes you will know that I am the Lord God. So in the morning in verse 18, he, uh, what he said to the people in the morning of this day is the prophecy contained in verses 3 through 14 that he had not delivered to them yet. And when he got the news, I mean, when his wife died, I, this is his only reaction, I did as I was commanded. Period. You know, uh, all through the Bible, there are so many things that happen like this and the lives and spiral that in today's day, people would be detained forever. I mean, everybody would have known that Zika did it because he found her. No. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And didn't say He would be arraigned in the court of public opinion. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he says, I did as I was commanded, you know that what happened to her must have just floored or crushed him. Because we have a description of how precious she was to him. Uh, the desire of your eyes. Uh, and in the uh, next verses, he says, the, uh, what does he call it? Uh, the pride of your power, not that one, but the desire of your eyes uh, and the delight of your soul. Uh, and yet all he did was get on with the job that God had given him to do. I find that absolutely remarkable and I stand in the awe of uh, Ezekiel as a man that he could uh, lose his life through no fault of his and through no fault of his wife that he gets his prophecy that he thinks applies to Jerusalem. And lo and behold, it applies first to his beloved wife. And then the application is made, hey, these people with you and the people in Jerusalem are going to do the same thing when their the light of their eyes, the temple is destroyed, and the people are deported. I've commanded them to do just as you have done with your wife, not to weep, not to show any signs of public mourning at all. What is permitted apparently from these verses is private person to person expressions of grief. But nothing after you leave your house. In verse 21, he says, I'm going to profane the sanctuary. Of course, he's talking about its destruction at the hands of the pagans who will not only desecrate it, but also carry off all its utensils, holy utensils, and all of the treasures that were stored within it. Uh, the pride of your power in verse uh, 21, of course, is the uh, trust and faith they put in having the temple as a guarantee of God's favor which didn't turn out that way. The desire of your eyes, that which they held to be the most precious, and the delight of your soul, probably that which each one of them missed most after being carried into exile. Let's see, they had been in exile now about nine years. And I can imagine how homesick, homesick, and missing their families that, that they may have left behind that they must have been. Especially when they were there for the prophets were telling them next year we're going to be back again. Yes. And not only that, we're going to have our king, Jehoiachin, is going to be sent back. And they're going to put him back on the throne and we're going to be in good shape and uh, everything will be fine. Speaks of son and daughter, says undoubtedly those are those who were left behind when the captives were taken. Uh, verse 23, he says, uh, you will rot away in your iniquities. That is, you will spend a lot of time sitting there in this foreign land 
thinking about what you have done and regretting what you have done that your sin could cause such a great disaster to befall Jerusalem and the temple itself and the people there uh, so they will rot away in regret that's a terrible thing you know what regret just never seems to go away there are always situations in life when you come up to this context of what you're doing or who you with something will come up that will remind you of what you have not done or what you should have done and uh, I'd like to have your comments on uh, Ezekiel's reaction. In the morning, I did as I was commanded. His wife had died the night before, and he just carries out what the Lord told him to do. I find it odd that there was no protest written down. He's a faithful servant. Faithful servant. It's, to me, it's absolutely remarkable. If you think chapter 16, what we had to roll through there, and then chapter 23, what we had to go through there was remarkable, and it was, to me, this talks both of those. That God decided in his infinite wisdom to take Ezekiel's wife away from him and give him 24 hours' notice, or less than one day's notice. He did give notice, really. Really, very little. They didn't know what it was. No, 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 no. Jeannie. How do you find that the men of God do this? I mean, Abraham had to, had to, he was going to go through with something that's unfathomable. And believed in God and believed his word and was entrusted in the same way as Ezekiel. I'm sure there's other people that do the same thing. He would do what he had to do with his words. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's so uh, he there's not a Ezekiel doesn't talk a whole lot about mm -hmm. his wife, but us reading from what from the first few chapters of Ezekiel, she had to be, must have been a pretty impressive person also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when he was laying siege to the clay tablet and it drew them for what two and a half years or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean if somebody had to I, I imagine she was right there with him and, and taking care of his you know, he's chopped off his hair with his beard, and oh my goodness, <laughs> she's willing to lie. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, a woman it must have been infinitely patient and a servant of God yeah, to put up with what, watch her husband deal with what he had to deal with, right. and then consequently the burdens and extra burdens it must have caused. Her. And then God says, I'm going to take her away from you. We don't know how it was done. It's unimportant. But she died that night, and I did exactly what God told me to do without any elaboration or <clears throat> explanation whatsoever. And I knew I was about cry when I read that. So I apologize. Uh, let's see, verse 24. Ezekiel will be assigned to you. And how will he be assigned? When you watch him mourn over his wife. I want you to see how he mourns over his wife. Then I want you to do the same thing when the city and the temple are destroyed and all of the people are destroyed with it. Mine says that the day that I didn't realize this, I knew it was close, but said that the day that she died was the day the temple was set apart. I didn't know that. That's when they set fire to the temple. Okay. Do you think it could have, like, it could be because God's, I mean, God's pretty fed up at this point. Um, do, you, do you think it could be because he's like, I don't want to see you guys mourning over this. You haven't cared about it in how long? I mean, you've been putting idols in there and worshiping other objects as opposed to just worshiping me there. You haven't been keeping my commandments or doing anything. Actually, do so. Why, why mourn over it? Why destroy it? What do you care? I mean, maybe he just he doesn't want to deal with that. 
Well, uh, see, Jeremiah had been warning them, pleading with them for some 30 years already in the city. Ezekiel had been warning, pleading uh, for mm, about eight, six or eight years so far. So, my goodness, not, not to mention Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah even mentioned some of the things that are going to happen in Jerusalem. He, not necessarily because he usually deals with the uh, fall of the northern kingdom and warning them. But still, you can't say that they haven't had warning over warning after warning after warning and then for them to weep and mourn when they've been told for four decades now that this is coming. I don't want to see you moan and cry because I've been telling you that it's coming. And you haven't believed it. And you haven't believed it. You've listened to the prophets who said, peace, peace, everything's going to be fine and we're going to be restored. So a remarkable passage. Okay, well, Ezekiel was to be a living sign to them. Any more questions or feelings or thoughts about the path that the Almighty chose to take in this instance? No, the drama of mourning in that time. I'm sorry? The drama of mourning in that time was, was very elaborate, oh, yeah. very, very, you know, obvious. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's almost that, that God's comparing almost and knowing that their loss will be similar to Ezekiel's loss. Yes, that's exactly right, because he uses the same terminology. Uh, and, and, and to say that you take that away with this, I guess different uh, societies or different civilizations, you know, manage the mourning part in different ways, you know. Well, this, Obviously, we all need you know, because of the food part there and, and all that, but but it's 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 I guess dramatized differently or Oh, it's made with a public you know. Well, first of all they get the women who have been hired to do the morning. And I can't think of the word it starts with a P. You know, whalers, I guess if you want to call it that. And it was their job to uh, lament. You know, we had plenty of lamentations. To, uh, and of course, the lamentations uh, always uh, started with the good that this person has done, and that's the way the lament started here. And then they get to they don't spend too much time on the uh, negative part of the theory part. Of it. But yes, it's a big public public to do. Uh, okay, verse uh, 24, 25. God says, more for him, as for you, Ezekiel, will it not be on the day when I take from them their stronghold, the joy of their pride, the desire of their eyes, and their heart's delight, this is a repetition, their sons and their daughters, that on that day, excuse me, hmm, he who escapes from Jerusalem, will come to you with information for your ears. On that day, your mouth will be opened to him who escapes. Speaking of the messenger from Jerusalem to the exiles in Babylon. And you will speak and be mute no longer. Thus, you will be a sign to them and they will know that I am the Lord. You remember it was way back in chapter 3 that God told Ezekiel, you will be mute. Now I take that muteness to include, uh, to have an exception to him actually using, giving the prophecies. That, that's, my, hey, that's just my guess. Unless he had the handwriting and had somebody else read it. But he has been that way to see this. Uh, uh, come on, boy. The uh, first prophecy of Ezekiel, I think, was 592, so he's been mute in some respect for four, roughly four years so far. But now the Lord is saying the day's coming when uh, you will be mute no longer. Uh, 
Now on that day is not the destruction of the temple or Jerusalem, but the day that the news reaches Ezekiel. When it gets there, and of course it's a long walk, some 600 miles from Jerusalem to where the exiles were, or riding on a camel. It's a long trip, so it's going to be a time delay there between the time it actually happens and the time that Ezekiel gets the news. Uh, he speaks of the joy and the desire and the hearts and life. We've already talked about that. Uh, verse 26 is filled, fulfilled if you like to scribble in your margins in uh, chapter 33, verse 21. Uh, fulfilled exactly. The messenger arrives roughly, roughly two or three years later than this. Verse 27, your mouth will be opened. So he was to speak to the people when the Lord gave him a word. And up to that time, he was to remain silent. How many of you remember this? I will make your tongue stick to the roof of the mouth so that you will be mute and cannot be a man who rebukes them for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth. That's why I said that, John. And I may be off base. Uh, and you will say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses, let him refuse. That reminds me of what Jesus said in the New Testament. He who has ears, let him hear. For they are a rebellious house. That was sometime built back in chapter 3. So, speak to his wife. You know, that might be right. Yes. Yeah, but Johnny gets to listen to his wife for four years. What greater blessing could you have? There could have been some reason for his mute, for his waking up the next morning and going on his way. <laughs> Moving on smartly. This, uh, <coughs> ends Ezekiel's prophecies against Jerusalem. Have we had enough? Yes, we have. It's been pretty unrelenting for many chapters now with the Lord expressing in the most definite, unmistakable terms what he thinks of his people and their conduct. <clears throat> so, Let's not start another chapter. It's five minutes till. Uh, we're going to start from chapter 25 all the way to chapter 32. <clears throat> As we just discussed, God has been laying it on hard and heavy on his corrupt, faithless people for years now. And then he says, uh, by the way, your neighbors aren't exactly the pick of the flock either. In fact, they have been so bad that I am going to pass judgment upon them just as I have passed judgment on you because they have been almost as guilty, not quite, almost as guilty as you have been. So we're going to start with Ammon, then we're going to go to Moab, and then we're going to go to Edom, and then we're going to go to Philistines, and then we're going to go to Tyre, and then we're going to go to Sidon, and then we're going to go to Egypt, all around, and see what God has to say about their conduct toward him and toward his people. There might be seeing this because they were so pleased with what God did to, to Israel. They loved it. Yeah. Any further? Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight mindful of how we sometimes don't understand your ways, but trusting and having faith that you always do the right thing, always have and always will, and that you love us and care for us, and that you will take care of us and bring us home one sweet day. In Jesus' name, amen.